Well, without further ado, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, uh, again, this is uh, our first ever advanced spotter training uh, at the National Weather Service and State College. This is something that we've been talking about for many, many years, but finally getting the opportunity to do it. Uh, we expect this to be about a two hour long um, session. We're going to have a break right about in the middle. So realistically, around 7.30, so we will take a break. Um, and uh, I have uh, three of my colleagues here with me. I'm John Banghoff, also Michael Colbert, Rachel Gutierrez, and Mike Jurowitz, um, who are all going to be helping contribute to tonight. So thank you all for signing up. We're really excited, and uh, let's go ahead and get started. Again, just some logistical items here um, as I take control of the screen. Let me see if uh, my computer will allow me to click through. Uh-huh. Yep. Oops. Now I'm getting a little too click happy. Bear with us. Thanks a bunch. So uh, as we go through tonight, a couple ways to engage. Um, so at the end of the first half and at the end of the second half, we're going to open it up for questions. But throughout, feel free to ask us a question. Uh, you can enter your question in the GoToWebinar window on your screen. Um, which is uh, there on the right-hand side for you, or you can raise your hand. There's also that ability, and at the end, we'll be able to collect questions again at the first half and then at the second half. Um, as we get started here, um, let's go ahead and just give an overview of the National Weather Service in State College. Uh, we are located in uh, central Pennsylvania, and our office staff is comprised of the following. We've got 14 forecasters. We've got six electronics technicians and an IT support staff. They help us... Uh, run. They keep us up, updated and operating with our radar, with our computers, with all the different technology we use to do our jobs. We've got a hydrologist who handles a lot of the river forecasting uh, and flooding uh, concerns. We have a science operations officer. Uh, that's Mike Jurowitz here on the, on the call tonight. Um, we got a guy who uh, coordinates our observations program, so all the different weather observations, uh, things like that. Uh, we also have a warning coordination meteorologist that's currently vacant. Uh, the position has been posted. Some of you may remember Pete Young. He was the former warning coordination meteorologist. He's now gone, uh, has retired. We have an administrative assistant, our secretary, who keeps everything rolling for us and keeps us in line. Uh, and then a meteorologist in charge. Um, Barb Watson is her name. She's our boss. She, she kind of leads the ship forward and uh, does a wonderful, uh, wonderful job. Uh, we cover a lot more details about kind of a day in the life of a forecaster in our basic class and in the interest of time and getting to some of the more exciting content. We're not going to spend a whole lot more time on it at this point, but we are open 24-7, 365 all the way through the pandemic. We have been operating on uh, pretty much full operations. Uh, the only difference is now some of our uh, administrative shifts where people are working on projects, those are now uh, telework shifts, but because of our mission to protect lives and property, we've continued operating pretty much as normal. Uh, continuing to bring you accurate and timely weather information. Uh, and we also uh, have been tasked with continuing to maintain our systems, our Doppler radar, our uh, weather observation systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you have any questions about that, feel free to let us know, but I'm, I'm convinced that you guys are much more interested in the things to come. And so let's go ahead and uh, proceed forward here with um, looking at our first uh, topic. Um, and uh, one last screen that I'll take a gander at before we do that is just a map of uh, Pennsylvania. Just a note here um, about how this sort of spotter talk is going to work. If you're in the area outlined in yellow on the map, you are in the National Weather Service State College County Morning Area. If you're in any of the other adjacent offices in Pennsylvania or really anywhere else across the country, what will happen is we will pass your information along to local offices. So at the very end of this presentation, uh, I'm going to go over some details, but just the high level view. I'm going to send out an email tomorrow for those of you that have attended uh, and have attended for enough time. Uh, I'll send out an email tomorrow for you to fill out a registration form that can give us some of your contact information so that we can communicate with you. Uh, and if you are not in the State College County Warning Area, I'll pass that along to whatever office uh, in the forecast area you're in. Because if we don't necessarily need information about Arizona or Ohio, et cetera, we want information about our county warning area. So uh, that's just, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that more a little bit later. There's also all these uh, social media sites that you can feel free to connect with us on. That's where we post very regularly. Um, and uh, now, without further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it off to Mike Colbert, and he will uh, start talking about the first part of this talk, um, the thunderstorm ingredients. Thanks so much, Mike. Thanks, John. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, bear with me, everyone, as I get control of the screen here. The first section I'll be talking about is thunderstorm ingredients. So all, all sorts of, okay, all of the ingredients that, that we need in order to make a thunderstorm. So as we list those ingredients here, just 
still getting control of the screen here. Okay, first ingredient is instability. And this is what allows surface parcels and parcels in the atmosphere, which are, you can imagine them as like invisible balloons of air, um, pieces of the atmosphere that get lifted up and form a thunderstorm cloud. Like in that picture there, thunderstorm clouds are always tall. Um, so they need something to allow them to grow. And that is instability. And then the next ingredients are moisture and lift. Moisture, of course, you need to make clouds and moisture also uh, can enhance instability. And lift is the initial trigger that starts the rising motion of a parcel. Instability is what carries it high into the atmosphere, but first it needs a trigger to initially get it moving to begin with. And then in the case of severe storms, which we're going to be talking about, you also need wind shear, which is uh, how winds vary in either wind speed or wind direction as you go up in the atmosphere. And I'll go through each of these here and describe what I mean by each of the ingredients. So again, the first one was instability. And in order for air to rise, that air needs to be hot. Hot air rises. And how do we get hot air in the atmosphere? Well, it usually comes from uh, the sun heating the ground and the ground heating the air above it, as you can see in the little animation here. And then as air from the surface rises up through cooler air aloft, that is the term that we call instability. And this is also a reason why uh, typically if we start the day off with fog and stratus and that stratus can't break and you can't get some sunshine, sometimes that's why we see thunderstorms either being initiated later, very much later in the day or not at all because there's not enough instability. And essentially the larger the temperature difference between um, air at the surface and air aloft higher in the atmosphere, like several thousand feet up, the greater the instability. So instability is maximized on warm, sunny days with colder air aloft. And uh, a parameter in the atmosphere that we use in meteorology to measure instability is called CAPE, which stands for the Convective Available Potential Energy. And the larger the CAPE, the greater the potential for severe weather because the higher the instability values. So this is a little table here. Um, CAPE values typically range from um, numbers of, of just, uh, you know, between zero and a few thousand is typically the range. Anything under 500 is is pretty weak. Um, 500 to 1,000 is pretty typical for like lower end thunderstorms, usually not very severe. And then another column here that I have on this table is the theoretical maximum updraft velocity. Instability is very much tied to the um, updraft speed of the parcels as they rise up in a thunderstorm. And these are theoretical maxes. They're also known as the thermodynamic speed limit. So these are pretty much like if you took all the potential energy in CAPE and instability and turned it to kinetic energy into moving rising parcels, this is how fast they would go. Um, but there's actually things that slow it down too. Like if the updraft entrains dry air from the surroundings or as the updraft starts to produce hydrometeors and is now holding rain and, and hailstones that gets heavier and heavier, that slows down the, the updraft. So you never really actualize these maximum updraft velocities, but it does give you an idea of, of how strong they can get. Um, so CAPE over 2000, that's typical of the major severe weather outbreaks, um, also increases your chances for seeing tornadoes and derechos and large damaging hail. And theoretically, you could have a maximum updraft velocity greater than 140 miles an hour. Realistically, they're closer to 70 to 100 miles per hour at that point, which is still uh, pretty incredible for air rising straight up against gravity, going up 100 miles an hour. So the next ingredient is moisture. And of course, again, you need moisture to produce the clouds and precipitation, but it also increases instability. And the reason for that is as these parcels rise, um, you could again imagine them as like an invisible balloon of air that let's say this air that I grabbed right here It's invisible. It's full of gases. It's um, Dry there's no liquid water in it, but there is water vapor and as you lift that parcel up and it rises into the atmosphere into areas of lower pressure It starts to expand the water vapor actually condenses as that expanding parcel cools but that parcel of air now that it's condensing this latent heat of condensation, which warms up that parcel, making it warmer than the surroundings. So if the parcel has moisture, which means it has water vapor, a gas, um, the more moisture it has, 
the greater the instability can be enhanced as that parcel rises up through the atmosphere. Uh, one of the parameters that we use in meteorology to measure moisture is precipitable water, which indicates how much, uh, essentially how much rain would fall if you take all the water vapor gas in a column of the atmosphere and condense it down into rain, how much would fall just from that. Uh, typically one to two inches of precipitable water is typical of our thunderstorm environments in Pennsylvania. Anything above two inches is, is particularly high and gives you an increased chance of flash flooding potential. Third ingredient is lift. And again, lift is that initial kicker that gets the parcels off the, essentially off the ground and up to their level of free convection, at which point instability takes over. And there's a few things in the atmosphere that can cause parcels to rise. A few of them are synoptic boundaries and fronts, like a cold front, uh, warm fronts, and even um, terrain. If air uh, flows towards a mountain, obviously it can't go through the mountain, so it has to lift above the mountain, and that could lift uh, parcels to their level of free convection sometimes too. And while we're talking about terrain, terrain can influence thunderstorms in a number of ways. In fact, they can change the environments around them. They can cause storms to intensify or to weaken. Um, squall lines here in Pennsylvania, which are lines of thunderstorms, they often weaken as they get into the state college area. Uh, that's not because all the meteorologists live here and they're watching the storm, but it's actually because of these lee waves, uh, which are a type of gravity wave and they have ascending and descending branches to those waves. Um, they form downwind of of terrain features like the Allegheny Front in this case. And when a thunderstorm encounters the descending branch of that lee wave, it can actually weaken or kill off that thunderstorm. Eventually they do fire up again as they as they move into the ascending branch of that wave and go on into Eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, but that's one of the main reasons why thunderstorms actually weaken here in Center County for anybody living locally who's noticed that. So here's an example of thunderstorm initiation along and ahead of a cold front boundary earlier this year in the Midwest US. And uh, that, that map there is a surface map. And uh, what I have hatched out there in the, the black circle, those orange dashes are the pre prefrontal trough. And that's another boundary that can form a number of ways. They can form from, from gravity waves or cold fronts aloft or really a, a number of things, but they do cause winds to converge at the surface. Uh, near the ground. And that's another way that parcels can get lifted up. So it provides that lifting mechanism. And you can see in this satellite loop that, uh, I'll let it loop back to the beginning, but you can see that the thunderstorms uh, observed by this satellite form right along and ahead of that cold front on both the cold front and the prefrontal trough right there. Uh, this satellite loop also has lightning from the global lightning mapper, um, part of the uh, the GOES-15 satellite array. So a really cool um, image of really seeing the whole cold front and prefrontal trough light up with convection, and that convection persisting for several hours as it moves towards the Gulf Coast of the US. Then I mentioned that wind shear is another ingredient uh, typically found for severe thunderstorms. Wind shear is defined as winds changing direction or changing speed with height in the atmosphere. And this shows both examples um, of directional shear and speed shear. One of the things I kind of want you to remember conceptually is that when you have speed shear, you get what's pictured there as like a uh, rotating, almost like a, a vortex tube, which is air that's being, uh, because the air is moving faster aloft than it is at the surface, kind of uh, curves over itself and you get these rotating, horizontally rotating columns of air, horizontal columns, uh, due to the wind shear. So keep that in mind. It, it might come in handy as a conceptualization as we go uh, deeper into the talk. Thunderstorm ingredients, uh, again, wind shear um, helps to, to make thunderstorms severe. It can help the updraft be sustained for longer. On the left side there is a picture of a, a thunderstorm or a rain shower where there's very little wind shear and rain actually falls right through the updrafts because there's no differing winds aloft to kind of tilt that updraft over. So the updraft just goes straight up and the precipitation falls right through it, eventually killing off the updraft. And these storms only last a very short period of time on the order of about 20 minutes, and they typically don't produce severe weather. But on the right is a picture of a supercell where there is high wind shear and rain actually falls downwind of the updraft uh, because of the stronger winds aloft pushing that 
uh, pushing the precipitation away from the updraft so the updraft can remain intact. And uh, when that's the case, severe weather is more likely. Now, the next thing I'm going to show here is what's called a skew T diagram. It's a way of plotting temperature, dew point, and wind speed through the depth of the atmosphere at a given point. So this is for one specific point on a map. And uh, on the bottom there is the temperatures in, in Celsius there. On the left is altitude, um, actually altitudes here in red and kilometers, and then pressure decreasing uh, in these white numbers. The pressure is in millibars. Uh, pressure decreases as you get higher in the atmosphere. So that's a convenient way to label um, the vertical extent of the atmosphere here. And then what's what's plotted in the colors in the middle, the red is the temperature, and that's the temperature of the environment or the atmosphere. So you can see it decreasing. It starts at the surface at around 91 Fahrenheit, so about 30, 35 or so um, Celsius. And then that temperature decreases as you go higher and higher in the atmosphere. Green is the dew point, so dew point plotted again at the surface, 69 degrees Fahrenheit, and then decreasing as you go up. When dew point is close to the to the temperature, when the green and red are close together, that's an area of high relative humidity. When they're farther apart, that's a dry layer, a layer of lower relative humidity, which you can see here in the mid-levels. Um, and then on the right side here are the wind barbs, and the way that you can measure, uh, the way that you read these is uh, a flag is worth 50 knots. So these triangles, uh, like up here at the 200 millibar level is 50 knots. A whole barb is 10 knots and a half barb is five knots and you would add those together. So in this case, uh, 50 plus 10 plus five is 65 knots. In the direction, um, the wind is coming from the direction that the barb is pointing. So in this case, it's coming from the Northwest. So Northwest wind of 65 knots at uh, right there at 200 millibars. And you can see as you go, um, actually starting from the surface and going up, you see a lot of these winds at low levels are from the, the southwest at about 10 to about 25 knots. So that's how you would read the wind barbs. Um, this next line here, this white dashed line or gray dashed line is the rising parcel temperature. So I briefly mentioned earlier, because of that moisture, as a parcel rises and water vapor condenses, that parcel because of the latent heat of condensation becomes warmer than its surroundings. And that's shown here in the dashed line, the temperature on the right side of the red line, which is the environmental temperature. Parcel temperature is always warmer uh, when there's instability. And this pink layer, uh, a pink area being drawn out here is actually how we measure CAPE. So the, the bigger that area, the greater the CAPE. Uh, and that means the stronger the updraft can be, the faster the updraft can rise because as that area is bigger, that means that the temperature of the parcel was warmer than the temperature of the environment for a longer amount of time, meaning instability is, is growing. And then you can also analyze wind shear by looking at this uh, skew -t diagram, by looking at how the, temp the, uh, sorry, the wind speed differs at different layers of the, uh, the atmosphere. So that's about 20 knots of zero to six kilometers shear. It's unidirectional, which means it's all coming from the same direction and, um, 20 knots is, is kind of on the, the lower end, uh, discrete cells and, and maybe a few, um, uh, maybe a few multi-cell clusters as well. And that's actually a good segue to uh, the next section. But one, one last thing here, if you ever want to find a real-time observed sounding, you can find them at SPC, the Storm Prediction Center's NOAA.gov web, website there. So I have a link there. Okay, and that's a segue into the next section, which is types of thunderstorms. Uh, the first type is ordinary thunderstorms. You typically see these when there's lower shear environments. And again, this is a, an updraft that grows. It starts out as a towering cumulus. We've seen plenty of those around here in Pennsylvania the past few days, plenty of towering cumulus, and a few of them growing up into a mature storm. Um, but ultimately in these ordinary cells, because there's no wind shear to tilt the updraft, um, the Precipitation ultimately falls through the updraft and kills off the storm, leading to the dissipation phase of the ordinary thunderstorm. Uh, this whole life cycle from towering cumulus to dissipation can take uh, 20 to 40 minutes, typically. And then as you increase the amount of shear, you start to get different types of thunderstorms, like multi-cell thunderstorms. Uh, in this case, the updraft is tilted. Precipitation falls downwind of the updraft, um, so you can get many 
cells uh, forming next to each other and the updrafts being maintained for longer. Um, another reason that shear can produce multi-cell clusters is that when the downburst comes down from the thunderstorm, it actually produces little um, rotating horizontal columns of air on the downdraft. And then there's the shear from the atmosphere, which has those vortex tubes that I showed earlier. And where those two combine, it actually enhances lift. And, um, and that's another way that these multi-cell thunderstorms are favored in a higher shear environment. So that's, the, that's another type of thunderstorm. And then derechos and squall lines is a specific type of multi-cell clusters where new cells continually, continually form on the leading edge of the system. Uh, they typically have a lot of strong winds with them, especially with the derecho uh, and updrafts and downdrafts that form a big line. Um, so that's a specific type of multi-cell cluster. When it becomes oriented like a line, it's known as a squall, squall line. And we had an example here in Pennsylvania of a, a squall line and derecho uh, back on June 3rd. This was a derecho that started up in northwestern Pennsylvania in the morning. It was a Wednesday morning, started up near, near Warren up there and then intensified. It really wasn't that strong when it moves through State College, but then as it moved into the uh, between Philadelphia and the New Jersey coastline, it actually produced several measured wind gusts of 80 to 90 miles per hour, which was really uh, pretty incredible. So that's an example of a multi-cell cluster that's a squall line and also classified as a derecho because uh, derecho has a, a significant winds over a large enough span um, horizontally, a uh, long enough distance, and then it's classified as a derecho. Um, so that's a look of all the wind damage reports that are called in by Skywarn spotters, most of them, and, and some are found other ways, like from 911 uh, and, and other emergency managers might call us. Um, then we submit them at the National Weather Service, we submit them in the Storm Prediction Center, plots them on the map there. So you can see lots of blue W's, all wind damage reports, and a few measured wind gust reports there, and even a couple of uh, green H's there, which are large hell too. And then one last look at the derecho from June 3rd. This is from the um, GOES, GOES satellite and also, again, lightning plotted on top so you can get a look of how the lightning uh, lightning flashed on that derecho as well. And while we're speaking of snow squalls, I'll briefly just bring up, uh, sorry, as we're speaking of thunderstorm squall lines, I'll briefly bring up snow squalls, which is a type of squall line in the, in the wintertime. Uh, these form when you have lift from a cold front and some modest low-level instability. You can actually get these snow squalls, which we're pretty familiar with in central Pennsylvania. They um, can be life-threatening for motorists because they drop visibility down to near zero, and there's heavy snow and strong winds, and they can uh, produce icy road conditions as well as that near zero visibility, really making driving treacherous. Then finally, another type of thunderstorm and often the most severe is the supercell. These occur when there's um, very, very strong amounts of shear as well as instability in the atmosphere. This is a look at one, um, kind of a diagram of what a supercell thunderstorm looks like from a distance. You can see the cumulonimbus. Um, that's pretty much the, the whole thunderstorm there, the cauliflower bottom as well as the anvil top and even the overshooting top, which because of all that instability, um, the updraft is rising so fast that it punches through what's called the equilibrium level at the top, which is essentially uh, where the, the stratosphere starts. And it punches through that and causes this overshooting top, which you can see a picture there. So if you ever see a, a storm like that from a distance, you know that that's, that storm is particularly strong. And then on some supercells, there's also a wall cloud, which is pictured there at the bottom. That's a low hanging, part of the cloud associated with the rotating updraft. And then in a smaller percentage of supercells, it's, it's about roughly one to 5% of supercells produce a tornado, uh, which is imaged here. And then you can see other parts of the supercell um, outlined here in the diagram, the flanking line, which is uh, along, the, uh, along the leading edge of one of the cold pools associated with the supercell. And that's providing lift for more towering cumulus. And then underneath to the right of the wall cloud, you can see the rain and hell um, precipitation falling from that. 
Uh, briefly, some types of supercell thunderstorms you might observe. Low precipitation supercells happen when the atmosphere, uh, the depth of the atmosphere is relatively dry. It has lower amounts of precipitable water. Uh, pretty rare to see those around here in Pennsylvania. These are more typical of the high plains of the western United States. Uh, the right side here, the high precipitation supercell is, is more typical of what we see around here. Um, they're less photogenic. They can, if they do have tornadoes, the tornadoes are often rain wrapped, so they're harder to see. And um, we get high precipitation supercells in Pennsylvania when we do have supercell environments. They're often linked with plenty of moisture that's coming from the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. Bear with me. I'm trying to advance the slide again. Okay. Yeah, so that wraps up the thunderstorm ingredients and the types of thunderstorm part of the presentation. I'm now going to hand it off to Mike Jerowitz, who is our science and operations officer, and he's going to handle thunderstorm hazards. Thanks. Okay, Mike, thanks for the nice segue. So we will, uh, as we I gain control here, we'll advance the slides and we'll, we'll go into thunderstorm hazards. So the first hazard we're going to talk about is, is lightning. And if there's one of the important points I'd like everyone to leave with tonight is that technically, regardless of a storm's quote unquote severity, and we'll talk about severe thunderstorms uh, a few slides down the road, all thunderstorms are dangerous because all thunderstorms have lightning. So even if a storm is not technically warned for by the National Weather Service, all thunderstorms are still dangerous because by, by definition, they do contain lightning. So how, how does lightning form? How does this physically happen? Basically, it, is, it comes down to charge separation. So typically the, the air particles that are in the upper reaches of a thunderstorm near the tops of the clouds are positively charged. Also, most of the air parcels residing near the ground are positively charged. So what happens when you're developing a thunderstorm? Mike was talking about uh, updrafts and downdrafts in the previous section. So when a thunderstorm updraft is basically how a thunderstorm gets its moisture feed, how it, how it gets the moisture and instability. But ultimately, these updrafts are going to get filled with more and more rain droplets and, and hailstones over time. As that happens, it's going to get harder, even in uh, updrafts with very fast upward speeds, for them to suspend all these particles. Eventually, gravity is going to win out and the raindrops and hailstones, uh, if they survive all the way to the ground without melting, they're gonna start moving down. And typically these downward moving hydrometeors, they acquire a negative charge. So now you're in a situation where uh, we are number two here, you still have the positive charges at the top of the cloud, but now you're having these gradually descending raindrops and ice particles with negative charge. So the first thing you've accomplished now is that you're starting to separate the charges in the cloud level with the positive charges near the top and the negative charges near the base. That basically allows electrification to start in the cloud. So that's when you begin to see your in-cloud flashes of lightning. And then as these negatively charged hydrometeors approach the ground, you also, you're, you're gonna have uh, electrification between the uh, falling hydrometeors and the positively charged uh, air particles near the ground. So that's when you start to get your cloud to ground lightning strikes. So it basically lightning, it comes down to once a thunderstorm reaches a certain stage of development, you get these positive and negative charges to separate, that allows the electrification to occur, and voila, you have lightning. So, um, as alluded to on the right-hand side, most lightning strikes, most cloud-to-ground lightning strikes, the vast majority of them, in fact, are negatively charged. 
and certainly these negatively charged lightning strikes are dangerous enough. All lightning strikes, of course, are dangerous. But a subset of these lightning bolts are actually positively charged. Uh, and as the graphic here shows, a positively charged lightning strike carries much more voltage than a negatively charged. At times as much as one billion volts of electricity can be contained in one positive lightning strike. And sometimes these are called bolts out of the blue as well because you have the positive charge which starts in the upper part of the cloud. It actually uh, fans out horizontally and then can, can drop down to the ground sometimes as much as 20 or 25 miles away. So again, this just drives home the point. All thunderstorms are dangerous because they have lightning. And sometimes a cloud to ground lightning bolt can occur quite far from the center of the storm. So if you're close enough to a storm to start hearing lightning or start hearing thunder, even if it seems like it's distant, that's the time to seek shelter. Okay, so uh, we, we talked very quickly about uh, thunderstorm severity I did a couple of minutes ago. So the National Weather Service, we have formal definitions on what makes a thunderstorm severe. Uh, you need wind gusts of at least 58 miles per hour or 50 knots. You need hail of at least one inch in diameter. If a thunderstorm produces tornadoes, of course, it, it, it is severe. And then we have the other threats of lightning, which we just talked about, and flooding if uh, the rainfall is heavy enough and, and, and stays over one area for a long enough period of time. So a lot of people wonder why, why 58 mile per hour winds? So that's, that's not just a number we pulled out of thin air. There have been a lot of previous engineering studies done. And once you start getting wind gusts upwards of you know, 55, 57, 58 miles per hour, those studies indicated that that's when structural damage to homes becomes much more likely. Siding being torn off, uh, windows being blown in, uh, shingles from a roof being torn off. Typically you need winds at least that speed to start causing that structural damage to homes to occur. And as far as the one inch diameter hail, one is certainly a nice round number but also again through a lot of insurance studies as far as claims that are done from hail damage, uh, windows being cracked, windshields to automobiles being cracked, uh, automobiles being dinged by the hailstones. That tends to be much more frequent again when you get the hail diameters greater than or equal to one inch. So that's kind of the, a little bit of the background history behind uh, where these numbers came from. So let's talk about hail for a couple of minutes. How does hail form in a thunderstorm? So I'm gonna uh, click through these ingredients here real quick and then I'm gonna talk about each one. So in order for hail to form in the first place and start growing, first of all, you need a little ice embryo. And uh, almost all thunderstorms have these up at cloud level. It's simply a matter of can they have enough residence time at the upper altitudes to actually grow in size so that they don't completely melt before they eventually come down to ground level. So you start out with this ice embryo and then uh, naturally also in thunderstorms you have these super cooled liquid water droplets, many, many rain droplets of course in a thunderstorm. And these super cooled liquid water droplets, they're gonna tend to adhere to these ice embryos. So you get the, uh, the li super cool liquid water, which kind of sticks to the outside of the ice. And then it kind of forms nicely around the periphery. And eventually it's gonna freeze. And as you can well imagine, as this process occurs continually, that ice embryo is gonna grow as long as it remains uh, suspended at a cold enough altitude uh, in the thunderstorm where the ice formation is happening quicker 
then any melting is occurring. And in order for that to happen, ingredient three is important. You need a sufficiently strong updraft. You need the currents in that thunderstorm updraft to be moving uh, vertically upward quick enough where it doesn't allow these hail embryos to start dropping out of the storm and reach ground level. And of course, the higher these embryos are suspended, the colder the temperature, and uh, the more readily additional ice is gonna be able to, uh, you're gonna have additional accretion of ice on the outside of these embryos. And you need sufficient resonance time. And, um, and the last point too is the trajectories of the hail. So these hailstones actually, they, they follow interesting paths in a thunderstorm updraft. They don't simply come straight up and come straight down. A lot of times they'll do these little loop-de-loops. Sometimes they'll, they'll uh, move horizontally in the updraft. And bottom line, the longer that the embryos can stay suspended and that allows that ice to grow bigger before it ultimately gravity wins out and it starts to drop. So these are some pictures uh, of very large hail that has been recorded over time. Uh, you can see many, many inches here. Uh, I believe the largest hailstone recorded in the United States was upwards of seven or eight inches in diameter. And you can just imagine the damage that an eight inch diameter uh, ball of ice can do when gravity's pulling it down and uh, strong winds are moving it in a horizontal direction as well. And again, these are just some pictures. Uh, and that, that actually is uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, hailstones ever recorded was in South America. And that was, that was fairly recently, within the last year or so. So, and these are some uh, hail photos from closer to home. We had an event late last May, May 28 of 2019. We had uh, several fairly intense supercell thunderstorms right here in Pennsylvania. And these are pictures that Skywarn spotters such as yourselves, uh, they took these as these hailstones fell uh, at their house or wherever they were making the reports. And uh, you can see they did some great things that really help us. They took photos, they sent the photos to us. They compared the hailstones uh, to an object like a coin. So that gives us a nice reference point for how big they are. Uh, sometimes people actually have a, a, a little ruler right next to the hailstones so we can visually see uh, uh, the, the diameter size of the hailstone. So these are all really good reporting practices for Skywarn spotters is when you experience hail and you want to report it to us, taking pictures are great. And when you do that, if you could provide a frame of reference like a coin, or if it's a really large hailstone, maybe a baseball, a tennis ball, uh, better yet if you had a ruler and put it next to it so we can see for ourselves the, uh, the diameter size. These are all really things that we really appreciate in the weather service when the spotters go the extra mile. So uh, we talked about lightning, we talked about hail, let's talk a little bit about wind damage. And again, this gets back to the Two of the really important parts of a thunderstorm are the, the storm updraft, which basically, again, is the energy feed. It's where the storm is able to ingest uh, instability and moisture. But eventually, uh, again, gravity wins out, and you have these very cold, dense currents of air that start dropping that are full of raindrops and hailstones. So, of course, as this cool dense air begins to drop, it's encountering progressively warmer air as you get closer to the ground. So this uh, cold, dense air is becoming, relatively speaking, colder and denser than its surrounding environment. It just causes it to pick up speed over time. So that in combination for, with uh, gravity, it allows uh, these downdrafts to sometimes hit the ground at very high speeds. And when that happens, it basically uh, it, it hits the ground and it fans out in all directions. And uh, that's what's called a gust front. When the downdraft first hits the ground level, 
and it kind of fans out almost at uh, 360 degrees from where it first hits ground level. And these winds can be very strong sometimes with these, these downdrafts. Um, upwards of 80 to 100 mile per hour winds have been clocked a number of times in these downdrafts, which can be quite damaging. And you see the little, um, uh, the pictures of the airplane trying to fly through a downdraft. One of the uh, big things about 35 to 40 years ago that really clued us into how dangerous these downdrafts are to aviation safety. Unfortunately, there were a, a number of tragic aviation uh, mishaps in the 70s and early 1980s that actually led to the Weather Service developing the Doppler radar system that we, we currently use today. And uh, downdrafts are extremely dangerous for aviators. So um, it's, it just underscores how critical it is for pilots to be well-versed on weather information, to get proper briefings, and, and to be, uh, to get, so they know how to route around these uh, downdrafts and don't get caught in them. And so this is a little movie loop here that we'll let play through. This is a downdraft that occurred in Adams County in South Central PA just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so when we were, we were lucky enough to get a time-lapse uh, uh, image of this. And you can see as we get further along here, as the, uh, the raindrop uh, density grows and the winds start growing stronger as they get evicted down. And eventually you're gonna see what happens to one of these buildings in the background as the wind, the strongest winds really come down. And, and so, and there it goes. So, um, and again, the, the, this kind of damage is not terribly unusual with the stronger downdrafts. They can certainly cause plentiful damage to structures, especially ones that maybe weren't built up to code, um, maybe have a weak spot. Sometimes we see when uh, we go out and do storm surveys, uh, the day after uh, intense storms come through, people leave their garage open, you know, the winds can get caught underneath and lift the roof and then, then the walls collapse. So there's, there's all kinds of weak points to a structure the winds can get in and cause damage. So that's just one time-lapse uh, photography there of the kind of things that can happen in the stronger downdrafts. So um, the next thing we're going to talk about is tornadoes. And I'm going to click through these ingredients here quickly, and then I'm gonna, going to explain them. So tornadoes are obviously one of the most dangerous facets of a severe or supercell thunderstorm. In the grand scheme of things, tornadoes are very rare. It's only a strict minority of thunderstorms that become supercells, and it's even a stricter minority of supercells that actually form tornadoes. So I think that kind of feeds people's fascination with them because of their rarity and also, of course, because of their, their uh, incredible danger. So I'm here to debunk the the kind of a Wizard of Oz uh, mentality that for many, many years we had of how tornadoes form, about how you see the funnel form in the cloud level and the funnel starts descending toward the ground. That's not really how, how tornadoes work. Tornadoes are pretty mysterious and there's, there's still a lot that we're learning, but there, there are some things that we do know. And one of them is that's, that's not how they happen. It's actually a fairly complicated three-step process that leads to uh, tornado development. So the first one right here, if you remember Mike in the previous section, he talked about the wind shear causing these uh, horizontally oriented, uh, almost these rotating cylinders, these vortex tubes. And so, Thousands and thousands of these invisible vortex tubes exist really almost every day. And, and especially on days when there are thunderstorms in the area. 
So the first step to a uh, potential future tornado is that you, again, remember you have an updraft for a thunderstorm. And that updraft is strong enough to take these rotating vortex tubes that are laying on the ground to stand them straight up and actually ingest these vertically oriented vortex tubes up into the storm. So when that horizontal spin is able to be tilted in a vertical direction and ingested into the storm, that causes what meteorologists call a mesocyclone. And that typically occurs anywhere from three to 6,000 feet above ground level. So now you have this rotating column of air that's, that's several thousand feet off the ground. So that's step one for a tornado. So again, tornadoes, they form out of supercell storms. So you have an updraft and a downdraft. So once you have enough raindrops in the downdraft, they come down, this cold, dense uh, current of air hits the ground, and the air spreads out in all directions. So once you have the downdraft, you can kind of imagine, now you have these new sources of horizontal spinning air that form at the leading edge of the gust front in these downdrafts. So you have the mesocyclone that's already formed up at the storm level. You have these new areas of spin near the ground from the downdraft. And then if these new areas of spin can get track close enough to that original updraft, which is now rotating, and the updraft is able to pull this up into the storm, now you're essentially linking the new area of spin that's getting pulled in with the original mesocyclone aloft, now you have your tornado. And so it's, it's really kind of a, a complicated interplay of how this works. Definitely not as simple as just uh, rotation aloft, descending and eventually reaching ground level. And these schematics here from our friends at uh, Penn State Meteorology Department, they kind of show that process where on the left-hand side, you see the football, it's lying down at the ground, but eventually uh, if this football gets tilted into the vertical, so it's kind of standing up on its end, uh, kind of before the kicker goes to kick it, it gets pulled into the storm. Now you have that uh, rotating updraft several thousand feet off the ground. Then eventually, a bit off the screen here, you get a downdraft with a lot of rain and hail that comes down, it hits the ground, the gust front spreads out. You have these new areas kind of spinning like footballs on the ground again. But if one of these can get close enough to that original updraft, get tilted again and pulled in, you can get a merger of the mesocyclone aloft with the, the newly vertically tilted spin. And that's what causes a tornado. So again, quite a complicated process and it's taken many years of research for us to, to figure out that's how it happens. But it's really not even that simple. You can get a situation where even if you get some of these steps that we just talked about, if that kind of new source of, of spin on the gust front, even if it gets close to an updraft, if that air is too cold and too dense, or maybe that original mesocyclone aloft isn't spinning fast enough to be able to suck that into the vertical, you're still not gonna get a, a tornado. So it really is a very unique, rare idealized set of, of, of atmospheric um, setup that you need to get a tornado. Uh, actually quite a few more modes of tornado failure really than there is of tornado genesis. And this is why tornadoes are so rare. But of course, when they form, they're, they're extremely dangerous. So this here is a picture of, um, uh, from a supercell storm, I believe out in the Great Plains. 
and on the left hand side here where the cursor is that is the area where the updraft you can just kind of picture where the updraft is pulling the stream of air up into the storm it's literally taking the stream of moisture pulling it horizontally and then tilting it up into the vertical uh, to eventually produce a mesocyclone now I'll go ahead and uh, hit the animation there. You can kind of see that in action. So you can see how that storm, storm's updraft is just pulling that uh, right up into the right and causing a uh, circulation to start forming. Okay, so then we're gonna uh, move on here. So this is, uh, these are some other pictures that are kind of interesting as far as reporting a tornado. This is another thing that we drove home in the basic Skywarn class, and it's certainly worth repeating now. A very necessary ingredient for a tornado is it has to be rotating. And sometimes you can have some very intimidating looking clouds, like the one, for instance, on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, this is not, by the way, a tornado. This was, uh, uh, again, a kind of a, a scary looking low cloud uh, painting down, but the, the cloud itself was not rotating. Sometimes in, in, in thunderstorms, you can get these little columns of moisture that can cause these low hanging clouds in certain parts of the storm. And at first glance, it might look like a developing tornado or, or a funnel cloud or something like that. But if it's not rotating, it's not a tornado. Now the image on the left here, this uh, is a supercell storm that actually was exhibiting rotation. So uh, if this uh, little uh, uh, funnel cloud here, if we started seeing contact of, uh, with the ground, contact of spin with the ground, in that particular case, you would have a tornado. But again, the picture on the right, not rotating, so not a tornado. And then here's another uh, couple of examples from the uh, Harrisburg area too. And I believe in these cases, again, uh, these clouds were not rotating. So if the cloud is not rotating, again, it may look fairly scary, it look fairly intimidating, but it's kind of nothing more than a low hanging cloud if you don't observe the actual spin, you observe the rotation. So that's a really important distinction that, that we need to know in the weather service so that spotters uh, giving us this ground truth can really, really help us out whether they are actually observing rotation in the base of these storms. So that is uh, bringing us to our, our break at the halfway point. And I think also John wanted to do a quick uh, Q&A session before we get there as well. Yeah, thank you so much, Mike. Um, Mike C and Mike J, as we call them in our office, did a spectacular job for the first part. Um, so at this point, I'd love to open it up for questions. Um, I'm going to go through and read a few, but feel free to submit questions in the little box and we'll be able to, to get to many of these. Uh, the first one uh, is, um, can you address the difference between power flashes and lightning flashes? Power flashes. No, I, can... Go ahead, I think typically power flashes is like power line flashes is usually what we hear of. Like if a tornado rips through a, a power lines, you see power flashes sometimes, and that's sort of damage to the electrical in infrastructure. And, and sometimes you can literally see uh, some of these uh, electrical substations where it almost looks like an explosion, but it's just these big flashes that occur, but, but really that doesn't have anything to do with lightning, like Mike was saying. 
Another question here, why doesn't Pennsylvania get as big of hail or as much hail as places like Kansas or the Plains? Well, uh, I think the main reason is we don't typically have as much instability. Uh, so when you don't have enough instability, you can't get the up that fast. And hail size is, is pretty closely correlated to um, up speed, uh, uh, updraft speed, uh, as well as whether the storm is rotating. So if you have strong rotation and strong updraft, that's going to be able to sustain larger piece, pieces of hail in the atmosphere for a longer period of time. Great. How far can the winds reach ahead of a thunderstorm before the storm reaches the location? In terms of distance or, or wind speed? Presumably distance, yeah. Like how far can the outflow get out ahead of a storm? Um, sometimes these these outflow, these cold outflow boundaries, they can move. They're like really dense undercurrents of air. They they can they can outpace the actual storm that's behind it. So it's not super unusual for you know a, a, an outflow boundary can get as much as five to maybe fifteen miles sometimes out ahead of a storm. Great. Another question here. Um, I've noticed that some thunderstorms contain a lot of lightning while others contain very little. What makes a thunderstorm more likely to have lightning? That's also pretty closely correlated with the instability. Um, essentially how much upward motion is there in the part of the storm that has ice crystals. Um, so if it's a, if there's not enough instability in that upper level of the atmosphere where it's cold enough for ice, then there's typically not much lightning. Just again, it's those ice crystals that are colliding with each other to make that charge separation in order for lightning to occur. Great. Um, uh, not sure of this answer, maybe you guys know, what's the biggest hailstone ever recorded in Pennsylvania? Do you guys know that off the top of your head? I want to say that it's around four to four and a quarter inches. Okay. Great. Um, another question here, if we have a video of what we believe to be a tornado, how do we send that video to you for evaluation? We'll talk about that at the end, but there's an email um, that is the best way to send that to us so we can review it um, to be able to uh, sort of add to our confidence in what happened. Um, I'll ask it, that if it, if it happens in real time, also call us. Uh, don't just send us the video and assume we'll see it right away. If it's real time, we need to know uh, as soon as possible. So give us a call on the phone. Great point, Mike. Yep. Uh, does a gust front create or support the formation of straight line winds? Yeah, a gust front is typically an indicator that there is straight line winds. Uh, it's very hard to tell just by looking at a storm how strong those winds are going to be but usually that does mark out the, the front of the straight line winds. Great. Uh, question here, what's the main difference between microbursts and downdrafts? Um, I'll go ahead and answer that. A microburst is just a particular strong downdraft. Downdrafts exist in every single thunderstorm, but the microbursts or the macrobursts based on their size are just uh, specific versions that are stronger downdrafts. Uh, another question here, kind of a comment, would they be considered scud? As far as low clouds, yeah, scud is the technical term for that picture that Mike J showed that wasn't a tornado when you got those low-hanging clouds, that is scud. Uh, here's a really good question. Uh, can you explain how the updraft and downdraft exist together and don't cancel each other out? Yeah, um, yeah, I could take this one. For the ordinary storm, um, as I was showing, when there's no wind shear to separate out the, the, the downdraft from the updraft, if there's not enough wind to blow blow the precipitation downstream, then ultimately the precipitation falls through the updraft and downdraft, and it does cancel it out. It does kill it off, and that's why ordinary cells only last about half an hour. Um, you really need the wind shear in order to separate out the updraft from the downdraft and have a sustained updraft. Great. Maybe uh, about two more questions here. Um, uh, I know many of you have questions and we'd love to answer those at some point, but just in the interest of time. Um, are Pennsylvania tornadoes more associated with warm fronts or cold fronts? That, that's a really good question. Um, 
there there certainly are some of of both if if i had to answer it um in many instances we need we've established we need wind shear for tornadoes and there tends to be quite a bit of wind shear near warm fronts so that's certainly a, a susceptible area for that great question now uh, another question here is there such a thing as heat lightning hmm. yeah heat lightning is a, a term often used to describe lightning that's far away in the distance and you don't hear any thunder associated with it that's just it's regular lightning it's lightning like any other type of lightning the only thing is it forms it's happening very far away too far away for you to hear it. the sound waves can't travel that distance but you can still see the light um, uh, whether it's i mean the the term heat lightning makes you think that it's just something to do with the air in, in the atmosphere being too hot and just spontaneously causing lightning that you can't hear that's not really what happens it is a thunderstorm it's just too far away typically happens on warm nights that's i guess why it's called heat lightning but uh yeah it's just regular lightning all right so there are a few more questions here but just in the interest of time we're going to go ahead and take uh let's do a five minute break um, so feel free to get up, go to the bathroom, stretch your legs, et cetera. And at 740, we'll get started. The second half of the presentation is going to be talking all about radar. Um, so uh, uh, Mike C, Mike J, thank you so much for your contributions to the first half. Uh, and we'll see you guys back here in about five minutes. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, everyone. It's now 7:40, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Hopefully, I'll have a chance to to take a bathroom break, get up and stretch your legs. Um, there's been a lot of questions coming in, and I'm I'm doing my best to get to some of those that I can. I've been typing in responses to the ones that I can answer individually, um, and then uh, again, we'll take some time at the end of this session to be able to have a few more questions uh, get answered. Um, so let's go ahead and get started talking about radar now. Radar is one of the, the main tools that we use, especially when it comes to detecting thunderstorms. Um, and it is invaluable uh, to us as meteorologists as we, as we move forward. So I want to start with the basics. I'm going to talk about some uh, of the legacy products, as we call them, the ones that we've used for quite a long time. Uh, and then Rachel, uh, who actually just got hired about a month and a, a little over a month ago, and has done awesome work for us, she's going to talk about dual pole radar. Uh, dual pole is one of the tools that we have that's made our lives so much easier has a lot of different unique applications and for those of you that are really interested in weather um, you can look at your radar apps and hopefully be able to better understand what you're seeing and how to use it um, so let's go ahead and uh, get started here we'll talk about an overview of what radar is all about uh, let me just uh let's see here yep did i we're good okay so uh, radar is actually an acronym. It stands for Radio Detection and Ranging. Uh, you can see I've highlighted radar. Um, and if any of you guys have ever seen one of these, this is what it looks like. This is sort of a, a, a visualization here. It's a schematic, but it kind of looks like a golf ball on a tee um, or maybe a soccer ball, something like that. But the one here in State College is up in Black Motion in State Park. Um, and so I've got the ground, I've got uh, the sky here, and then let's go ahead and add in some uh, clouds. Let me see if this will work for me. Yep, so we add some clouds. Maybe some of these clouds are a little bit taller. Maybe they're producing precipitation. Okay, and so how radar works is it's going to send out an electromagnetic wave, and this animation is going to show it well to you. So the electromagnetic wave is going to go out, and this inside this radar is a dish, uh, basically like a satellite dish that rotates all the way around uh, 360 degrees. And then it'll move up a little bit farther, and a little bit farther, and a little bit farther. And the various volume coverage patterns, as we call them, dictates basically what's going on in the atmosphere. So radar is going to detect rain here. It's not going to detect anything out here. And just a little known fact, radar, the radars that we use to detect precipitation and other things, actually can't detect clouds. So whenever you're seeing any signature on radar, you're not seeing clouds. You can only see things like precipitation, things that are a little bit bigger. Cloud droplets are just a little bit too small. So uh, we've been in collaboration with uh, Dr. Kumjin over at Penn State, the Department of Meteorology and Atmospheric Sciences. Actually, Rachel and myself both worked for Dr. Kumjin when we got our master's degrees, and he's put together some really cool stuff. So here's a radar, okay, a schematic again, and say there's a, a duck at some distance from the radar. Let's just, just use this example, okay? And so this green uh, is an outbound wave of electromagnetic uh, radiation or an electromagnetic wave. As it moves out from the radar, okay, maybe it'll come in contact with this duck. Okay, so this duck ends up getting excited by the electromagnetic wave. And because the duck um, is, is in the path of that beam, it's going to then reflect back to the radar. So the radar then spends some time listening. And based on the amount of power returned to the radar, that's going to indicate to the radar, is there anything out there? And if there is, what is the intensity of the return? Okay. So that's the basic premise. Let me just run through that one more time. Um, so going back to the beginning here, so radar sends out an electromagnetic wave, it hits something, in this case, it's a duck. Unfortunately, the duck is in the path, it's radiated, and then the, the wave is reflected back towards the radar. The radar listens and it receives that beam. Here's another depiction. So you can see from left to right is the thicker blue uh, wave that hits this little, so we'll say it's a raindrop, for example. The raindrops then is going to reflect that in all directions. The part that goes back to the radar is going to be received by the radar, and the radar will then indicate, okay, there's something out there that I can see. Another important note about radar, some of you guys may know this. Radar uh, is the, the beam shoots out at a little bit of an angle. The lowest angle here is 0.5 degrees, which doesn't seem like a whole lot. But when you combine that with the curvature of the Earth, slight curve, the farther you move away from the radar, the higher this radar beam scans. You can also notice that the, the height or the width of this beam spreads out as you move farther away. Okay, And so what's going to happen is when you're closer to the radar, the radar beam can see lower to the ground and can see low in the storm. So storms that are close to State College, we can see pretty well. As you move farther away, the beam's altitude increases and can overshoot the core of heavy precipitation. 
And so our radar coverage down in places like Harrisburg, Lancaster, et cetera, is not particularly great. Same as up, say, in Warren County. The farther you are away from the radar, the less good the coverage is going to be. Now, one thing that Mike uh, C. talked about earlier was snow squalls. Snow squalls are very, they're much shorter, right? not, not nearly as tall as summertime thunderstorms. So what can happen when snow squalls are, are uh, forming or moving across Pennsylvania when they're close to State College within a, a set radius, we can see them pretty well, but when they get farther to the south and east, we're overshooting it so the radar doesn't see them. That's when we rely on ground truth and reports from different weather stations or even spotters to let us know what's going on. So again, radar, as it moves, the beam moves away from the radar, it's going to move higher in the atmosphere. So the farther away you are from the radar, the higher in the storm you are scanning. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about these legacy radar products. Many of you guys may be familiar with these. The three that we're going to talk about are reflectivity, velocity, and spectrum width. Okay, reflectivity is the common uh, product that you're going to see on most weather radar applications. Okay, or when you're watching TV, these are these greens, yellows, oranges, reds, etc. That's basically showing you where there's precipitation and what the intensity of that precipitation is. So the first one again we will look at is reflectivity, and, and this tells us what and how much is in the atmosphere. Okay. Uh, I guess maybe this should say if there is anything. So if there is anything and how much is out there. So it measures return power back to the radar from a target. Think about our duck. The radar sends out a, a, an electromagnetic wave. It gets reflected back and the radar listens. And based on what it sees, it basically can plot and determine how long it took, where that uh, target was, et cetera. And the intensity of the meteorological target, so the precipitation, et cetera, is inferred from the power return. So something that's farther away is going to take longer to reflect back, right? Something that's closer is not going to take nearly as long. So based on the amount of time it takes to reflect back to the radar, that's going to tell us where that thing exactly exists. And that's units of dBZ, okay? And the scale generally ranges from about minus 35 to positive 85 dBZ, okay? And then this is the color table. Maybe a little bit hard to see. Totally understand that, but let's go ahead and break it down. So really anything that's underneath 20 dBZ is going to be extremely light, okay? So this right here, this is extremely light. This is actually not precipitate. This is not precipitation. This is non-meteorological. We're going to talk about how we can identify that. What we're seeing right here in this image is actually insects. Okay, so our radar can actually de detect insects, and you can see all the way across Pennsylvania on a perfectly clear sunny day, you can get insects, and insects can be seen by radar. These show up in the extremely light, sometimes the light uh, levels. Once you get up to say 40 dBZ, that so like 20 to 40 dBZ is going to be the light precipitation. The moderate is sort of in the 40 to say 50 range. Okay, this is when you're going to be getting moderate rain. And then once you get above uh, 50 dBZ, that's when you're talking about really heavy rain or potentially even hail. Okay, so hail because it um, is ice uh, and maybe some melting hail that's going to result in a higher power return. There's some other characteristics about whether it's ice or hail that we're not going to get into and talk about necessarily tonight. But this gives you an idea. If you start seeing pinks on radar, that's a sign that it's either really heavy rain or hail. And that's why when you're watching TV, maybe the, the evening news or local meteorologist, when it's red or it's, it's orange, they're talking about this is a really strong storm because there's a lot of precipitation that it's falling in a given spot. Okay. Now, um, we'll, we'll move forward now to velocity. So like I said, the radar sends out an electromagnetic wave that is reflected back. And basically what happens is based on the speed of that scatterer, okay, the, the speed of the thing that it hits, which direction it's moving, there's what's called a phase shift. Okay, So you, you may be familiar with the Doppler effect. It's very similar how as, as you're moving in a given direction, there's, a, there's a, a, a phase shift in the electromagnetic wave. And based on how much that shift is, that's going to tell us which direction the thing is moving and how fast it is moving. So radio velocity is what the radar actually measures. It can only measure the thing perpendicular to that wave. Okay, So it's the component of true velocity that's moving directly toward or away from a fixed point. So say I I'm scanning out in this direction and something's moving side to side in the screen. Okay, The radar is not going to be able to detect that kind of motion. But if I've got something maybe moving towards me on the screen and the radar sending out, that's going to be able to pick it up perfectly well. If it's a little bit of an angle, it's going to be a little different. It involves some geometry. Okay. When a radar scans perpendicular to the direction of motion, radio velocity will be zero. Does that make sense to, to you guys? So if the radar beam's sending it out, there's something moving perpendicular, it's not going to be able to detect that. So we have to infer what the velocity is actually doing when we see it. So this is an idealized schematic. This is in meters per second. It's also measured in knots or miles per hour. 
And generally the rule for uh, velocity is green, or in this case, blue for our red, green, colorblind folks is towards the radar. And red is moving away from the radar. Okay, so the picture here on the left-hand side, you can see green, this is to the bottom left, or on the right-hand side, blue is to the left, and then red is to the right in both of these situations. Okay, so on the left-hand side, we could say that the winds are moving from southwest to northeast. Okay, and these grays right here, be, when this the radar scans basically up towards St. Mary's, we said the winds are moving from southwest to northeast, so it's perpendicular, so it's not going to measure any velocity component in this particular spot. Okay, but it's going to measure the true velocity, say, up towards Williamsport or down towards Johnstown. And over here on the left hand or the right hand side, excuse me, the left hand side is blue. That's towards the radar. The right hand side is away from the radar. And so this would be a westerly wind, wind coming out of the west and moving to the east. And again, you see when the radar scans to the north, it's registering zero velocity because it's perpendicular. And then when it measures to the south again, that's it's perpendicular, so it's not going to detect anything. Another thing to note while we're on this screen, I want, I want to drill this point home. When you're closer to the radar, the stuff that's showing up is lower in the atmosphere, okay? So when I'm here at this first circle, that's going to be lower than when I'm over here on the far right towards the E. Does that make sense? So the farther I will move, move away from the radar, the higher I am in the atmosphere, okay? So again, green or blue towards the radar, red or orange away from the radar. That's going to be the scale we're going to use. Now let's look at a couple other examples to break this down, okay? So first off, on the left-hand side here, just focus on these wind bars. Remember what Mike C showed earlier? This is at the surface and this is farther uh, up in the atmosphere. You can see at the surface, the winds are coming from the south, okay? Southerly wind up at this, uh, some height in the atmosphere, they're coming out of the west, moving from west to east. And so what would a velocity signature look like in this situation? Well, at the surface, okay, close to the radar, the winds are coming out of the south. And so blue towards the radar, red or orange away from the radar. So this is the direction the winds are moving. As you move them maybe halfway, okay, that's going to be southwest to northeast. Okay, so maybe here is halfway, okay, that's halfway up. And you can see when we look at the radial velocity, the velocity is moving towards the radar here and away from the radar up here, kind of in this middle radial. And then as you move farther and farther away, so this outer circle, okay, so if we would just take a sliver on this outer circle, which is the highest point, it's orange here and it's blue here. And so that would imply winds moving from west to east. And so that's how you get this kind of curving pattern, okay? Now there can be another example, say there's a cold front moving through, okay? So you got a cold front moving through and there's a wind shift. So close to the radar and areas to the south and east, all the winds are moving from from southwest to northeast. And then here in the, in the northwest quadrant, winds are moving from northwest to southeast. Okay, so what might this look like? Well, at the surface, okay, so, so let's just disregard this top left, left uh, uh, side right now. Let's look at everywhere else. We said the winds are pretty much the same speed everywhere in this, right? Okay, and they're all moving from southwest to northeast. So this is gonna look totally normal. The zero area, is because it's it's along a radial and so the radar can't detect it everywhere else is southwest to northeast then when you move up to this direction all the winds are moving from northwest to southeast everything's moving towards the radar to the northwest of this cold front because of that everything is going to show up blue on this radar picture so oftentimes you can see a wind shift when there's a cold front or something moving through as you can imagine this can get way more complicated there's a lot more stuff to do with this but I wanna make sure you kinda of understand the basics before we move to other things, okay? Now, radar application, we can look at velocity signatures. This is one of the main ways that we can detect rotation, okay? So here's an example of a, uh, actually a tornado observed up in, in uh, Northern Pennsylvania in Tioga County. You can see reflectivity on the left, that's Z, that's what we're used to seeing. And there's, this is a supercell with a little bit of a hook. And then here on the right hand side, I'm sorry for those that are colorblind and can't see red and green, but to the bottom right is bright pink and the upper left is uh, the green and those right next to each other imply some strong rotation. So that's what we're gonna be looking for. Pink next to green, that's gonna imply on one side it's moving away from the radar really quickly, the other side it's moving towards the radar really quickly and the orientation of those help us determine whether or not there is rotation. The magnitude also matters. Sometimes there's rotation that doesn't quite meet the threshold for uh, being a tornado. And those are all things we look at and are continually monitoring at the office where we rely on spotters to let us know what's going on uh, at the ground level. 
Another example, this is a downburst, okay? So focusing here on the left-hand side, again, red particles moving away from the radar, green particles moving towards the radar. Here's the radar location. And if we have green here and red here, okay, that is along the same radial. So we, we know that as you move farther along the same radial or the same distance from the radar, this part is moving towards, right? This part's moving away. And so that's going to imply that there's a downburst. So wind surges down towards the surface, spreads out in all directions. In this case, you have a little bit that comes towards the radar, a little bit that comes away. And so that's a great way that we can tell, okay, how are things moving if they're diverging like that? That's going to be implication for a downburst and sometimes can even mean strong winds. Okay. Now, one last product that is maybe less important and less common, but I still want to cover it. Okay. Variability of motion. So spectrum width is what we use to, de to determine the variability of motion. Spectrum width is going to be really high if there's not much variability and really low. Sorry. Spectrum width is going to be very low if there's not much variability and very high if there is a lot of variability. So spectrum width, high spectrum width can indicate turbulent motion, but it can also highlight some data quality issues. So it's a good way for us to kind of tell what's going on. Now, an example of this is for what we call side lobe contamination. And so basically what can happen, you can have rotation in a tilted updraft. Remember, if they're shear, the, the updraft can be tilted. So maybe the radar is scanning kind of this level up here, maybe a mid-level, and there's some rotation there. Well, because of data processing issues, that rotation gets projected down to the surface. And so a, a, a signature can show up like this, where you have high reflectivity. We know that a tornado tends to show up in the hook region, okay? And if you just look at the storm relative motion or the velocity, again, red next to green, you could be like, oh, shoot, there's a tornado there. But when you look at where they're located in both situations, just by looking at these two, you see that the, the rotation is not co-located with where the highest uh, reflectivity is. So there's actually nothing there. And if we look at spectrum width, it's a dead giveaway that this is not a great report, right? Because again, the rotation from a higher level is being project projected down onto the surface. And this can be tricky because as a meteorologist, you look red next to green, maybe that means a tornado. I'm on edge, but if you look closely at the reflectivity, it's not a good example. Spectrum width is a dead giveaway. It can be helpful and is a nice tool to be able to detect where there's bad data or potentially even there's some really turbulent motion uh, that can occur along the way. Okay, I kind of zipped through that, but um, those are the, the main uh, legacy products um, that we've, we've looked at uh, over the course of today. And let me uh, go ahead and uh, click forward. I'm gonna pass it off now to Rachel. Uh, who's going to take over and talk to you guys about dual pole right now. Thanks for hanging in, guys. Really appreciate it. Okay. Hello. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, as John said, I'm going to be talking about dual pole radar. So that's the most useful products I think come from dual pole radar. Um, we're able to see a lot more things from it. So let me just click through here. Okay. So Normal radar or radar that doesn't have dual pole just sends out one singular beam. And now dual pole is able to send out two beams. One is horizontally oriented and the other one is vertically oriented. So the advantage of having these two different vertically and horizontally oriented beams is that it can give us an idea of the shape and the orientation of whatever it is that's out there. So we can get shapes of different rain, particles, we can get shape of hail particles, we can get all sorts of different information that we wouldn't normally get if we were just sending out one beam. So essentially we're figuring out with dual pole radar how mass is distributed within a particle and the relative, how the scattering properties of those particles are coming back to the radar. So that is essentially telling us if we can have, if we are seeing spherical particles, if we're seeing ice crystals or hexagonal plates, which are mostly horizontally oriented and flat, or if we're seeing more complicated things like uh, snow crystals that have dendritic growth, like what's on the right here. And this is the fundamental concept underpinning dual pole radar applications. So this is the main point is trying to figure out what is the mass of these particles and how they're oriented. So we had our legacy products. We have reflectivity, velocity, and spectrum width. But now we're gonna focus on the dual, pro, dual pole products, which is differential reflectivity, the correlation coefficient, and then the specific differential phase. So we're gonna break all of these down individually. Uh, they won't be so complicated, I promise. 
So the first thing we're going to talk about is differential reflectivity or ZDR, which essentially is just telling us what is the shape that we are seeing. And a nice little schematic here that breaks this down for us is uh, uh, going from left to right, something spherical, something horizontally oriented, and then something vertically oriented. Um, so something spherical has the X and Y dimensions are equal, which means our ZDR is going to be close to zero. If we move over to horizontally oriented, our X dimension is larger than the Y dimension. So that's going to yield a positive ZDR, so ZDR greater than zero. And then all the way to the right, vertically oriented means our Y axis is larger than our X axis. So ZDR is going to be negative in this case. Now I know looking at a picture is not necessarily the most helpful thing. So I have a few props here. Um, if you direct your attention to the webcam, this is a 3D printed hailstone and it's a little bit lumpy. It's not entirely spherical, but it's pretty close. So if I were to zap a radar beam at this 3D printed hailstone, my ZDR would be pretty close to zero. So this could be kind of classified as that spherical um, classification for ZDR. I have a cow here. My cow is more horizontally aligned than it is vertically aligned. Um, more of the particles are in the X axis than they are in the Y axis. So this would be an example of ZDR greater than zero or positive ZDR. And here I have a lightning bolt. And if the lightning bolt is being zapped by a radar beam, which this is a fake lightning bolt, not a real one. <laughs> um, I, we can see here that most of the particles are oriented in the Y direction instead of the X direction. So this would yield a negative ZDR or ZDR less than zero. And units of ZDR are dB. And this off to the right here is a general color scale of what you might see for ZDR. We're gonna be looking at this a little bit more in detail when we actually get to some examples on radar. So here are some more examples. Um, if you weren't looking at the webcam or picture, here are some actually real examples from real life. Um, so for spherical particles, this can be either drizzle, this can be hail, as long as it's spherically shaped. Hail can have funky shapes, but as long as it's mostly spherical, you're gonna get a ZDR of about zero dB. And then for non-spherical particles and that are electromagnetically small, we can have particles that are ma mainly oriented in the horizontal. So this would be a large rain raindrop on the left, for example, or a planar crystal. So if you didn't know this, raindrops are actually hamburger shaped. Um, I hope you can see this. This is a little glass bead. You can find these at Michael's. These are actually really popular to put into fish tanks. And this is actually the correct proportions of what a raindrop looks like when it falls down to earth. So raindrops flatten out at the bottom. And when we have large raindrops like this one and they flatten out, you're going to get a positive ZDR because we have more particles oriented in the X axis. Or if we have ice crystals, those also have more particles oriented in the X axis. So they're gonna yield a positive ZDR. And then for particles who have more particles aligned in the y-axis, we get a negative ZDR. And in this case, this picture on the right here is a, a piece of grapple, and it's actually a piece of conical grapple. So conical grapple falls the way that it landed in this picture, so straight down with its point pointing straight up. And in this case, we're going to have most of the particles oriented in the y direction, so we're going to get negative ZDR for this. So if you had nothing else, if you were just looking at reflectivity and ZDR for different precip events, you could probably tell what the shape is and what precipitation is happening, which is pretty cool. You can't do that if you don't have dual polarization radar. All right, so let's look at an application here for ZDR columns. Um, this is a schematic of a supercell and the pink magenta area is ZDR that's greater than two dB. We have our radar here oriented off to the right and the ZDR column is this uh, elongated part here that is actually co-located with the updraft in the storm. And this is because we have all of these raindrops here that are falling and growing at the same time. And when they do that, they become very horizontally aligned. And that's why we have an enhanced region of ZDR because we have all of those raindrops being uh, created and falling through the updraft. So it's becoming more horizontally aligned and we're gonna get a ZDR enhancement here. So if we uh, take a look at this a little bit more, 
we zap our radar beam through it, we can see that when our radar beam intersects this DVR column, it's just gonna be a little segment that lights up. And we'll see this here on this slide. Uh, we have now reflectivity on the left and ZDR on the right. And here, what's highlighted on the right here in ZDR is that ZDR column. Now, of course, it's not gonna look like a column on radar because we're only taking a slice through the atmosphere. We're not seeing the whole vertical profile, but we can see that there's a local enhancement here of ZDR, positive ZDR, which is where our updraft is located. And we can also see here and in the reflectivity, a kind of local minimum in reflectivity, and it's kind of surrounded by higher values of reflectivity. If you see this feature, um, it's called a bounded weak echo region, and that's also the location of the updraft. So if you see this on reflectivity and you see um, high values of reflectivity surrounding lower values, that's called a bounded weak echo region. That is where updraft is located. And if you pull up the uh, differential reflectivity or ZDR, you might see an enhancement here, which is also telling you that where the, this is where the updraft is. And this is gonna be telling you that this storm is particularly um, strong and that the updraft is strong and that we're getting a lot of rain out of this particular storm. Okay, so now we're done with ZDR, we're done with differential re reflectivity. We're moving now on to specific differential phase or KDP. And this essentially very basically it tells us how much is out there, how much of non-spherical stuff. So this now, this product does not care about spherical things, it cannot see them. It only cares about the non-spherical stuff. So radar beam goes out into space, it hits some non-spherical particles. And for those of you who really like physics and wanna know why this is actually happening, there's a phase lag between the horizontally polarized wave and the vertically orient, oriented polarized wave because of the non-spherical things. And when this phase lag accumulates, that's what we have as specific differential phase or KDP. And this is what we see when we pull up radar. So non-spherical non stuff, this would be our large raindrops, our hamburger bun raindrops, and hail that has lots of spikes. Um, so spiky hail, large raindrops, that is what KDP is going to see. And then it's like a reflectivity. So you can kind of use it like a reflectivity, but just remember that this is only non-spherical things. So we can also see bugs with this too. All right, All right. so here's an example um, that we use KDP for heavy rain and wet hail detection. So on the left here, we have our reflectivity, and on the right, we have specific differential phase or KDP. So here we can see there's a bullseye of maximums in both of the values here. So we have a high reflectivity and also an enormously high KDP. This is above eight degrees per kilometer, which is very, very large. And this, when they're co-located like this, we know that reflectivity is telling us that there is a lot of particles out there and there's a heavy concentration of those particles and possibly that those particles are large as well. That's what reflectivity is telling us. KDP is telling us now, there are a lot of non-spherical particles. So there's either a lot of heavy rain or there's a lot of spiky hail. So this is telling us again, I just said, very heavy rain or spiky hail or melting hail. Melting hail is non-spherical. When hail melts, it kind of forms like a little hula hoop around itself of water. So it becomes uh, kind of hamburger bun oriented like this. And that's when we have our small melting hail. So in this case, this was a case of a lot of small melting hail. Um, and this actually happened in State College. And I'm gonna show an example in the next slide of a different case. So recall, we're looking at heavy rain or small melting hail. And on the left here is an image of all of that small melting hail. You might think that this is a picture from a winter day in December of all that slushy snow. It's actually hail. Um, this was after a thunderstorm passed through from a local maximum in KDP. So if you're looking at radar and you pull up specific differential phase or KDP, and you see that this, there's a bullseye of maximum values that are greater than eight or even larger, you could expect that there's probably a lot of small melting hail for that storm. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to correlation coefficient, moving on from KDP. And correlation coefficient is measuring the variability in the scattering volume and is not dependent on hydrometeor concentration. So I know that's 
uh, kind of wordy, but that basically just means what is the diversity of shapes out there that we're scanning? And this correlation ranges between zero and one. So if the correlation coefficient is equal to one, that means particles are perfectly homogeneous. They're all the same. Everything is the same. All the raindrops are the same size, the same shape. Everything is perfect. If we have anything less than one, this means that now we're introducing particle diversity. So that might mean we have a hailstone and a cow, not just hailstones. So anything less than one means that we're introducing some diversity into the environment and that is going to lower our correlation coefficient. So if you're looking at correlation coefficient and you see something weird going on, think about how homogeneous are the particles that I am sampling. So there are a few ways to lower that correlation coefficient. We talked about diversity of shapes, so hailstone, cow, but there also could be a diversity of composition, so liquid versus ice. If you have a lot of raindrops mixed with a lot of hail, that can lower your correlation coefficient. And then also diversity of orientations, so snowflakes or tornadic debris. If, you're, uh, if you have a bunch of sticks from tornadic debris and some of them are oriented horizontally, and some of them are oriented vertically, that's going to lower your correlation coefficient as well. All right, so now we're getting into some meteorological and non-meteorological examples. So a high correlation coefficient or greater than 0 0.97, that would be your rain, your snow, anything uniform in precipitation. So if you're getting a lot of rain or if it's a day that's snowing, as long as the particles are all kind of the same, you're going to have high correlation. Now, non-uniform meteorological scatters are going to lower your correlation between about 0.8 and 0.97. So that's going to be uh, hail, wet aggregates, melting snow, that kind of combinations of all of those things. When you start introducing more particles of different types and orientations, that's going to lower your correlation. And then non-meteorological scatters like birds, insects, debris, that's going to significantly lower your correlation to less than 0.8. Um, which is actually a significant amount. So just looking at correlation coefficient can actually give you a lot of information about your environment as well. And there are no units for correlation coefficient. It's just numbers, which is pretty easy to understand. All right, so let's look at some applications here. So we call um, this feature on the radar the bright band, and you can probably see why. It's a really bright, uh, distinguished ring around the radar, and this is actually the melting layer. So what happens here is in the melting layer, there is a phase transition between ice above the melting layer, then it melts, and then water below the melting layer. So when they're in this melting layer, there is a combination of both ice and liquid because it's in the process of melting. And you can lower CC, or correlation coefficient, due to a diversity of shapes and composition. So that is what's happening in the melting layer. So when we see this feature on radar, this uh, decrease in correlation as a ring around the radar, we know that this is the melting layer. So anything close to the surface is going to be above freezing and stuff far away and up in the atmosphere, that's going to be below freezing. Now, why does it look like a ring? Let's go back here and look at a schematic of how a radar operates. So this is our radar in the middle here. Now we put this layer in here of zero degrees Celsius. This is our equilibrium point. So this is going to be the layer at which we can have both liquid and ice existing. And above zero degrees Celsius, we have our ice crystals. Below zero degrees Celsius, where it's warmer, we have our raindrops. And when the radar zaps its beam out into infinity, the radar spins around in a circle to gather data. So when it does this, it just spins around in a circle, gathering all this data. And that is why it looks like a ring on radar, because that's just how the radar operates. It spins around in a circle. Um, it only gets information um, for one specific height at that circle. I know John showed earlier that schematic of how radar beams uh, can move away, move higher into the air out from the radar. So as this beam gets farther away from the radar, it gets higher up into the atmosphere, moves around in a circle, and then we get this ring on radar. Sometimes the melting layer or the bright band can have some really strange shapes. So if we draw our attention to the uh, bright part out here, this kind of looks like that circle that we were seeing before. 
um, that nice circle that we were seeing, it's pretty easy to understand. But then we see that there's this uh, arm of lower CC jutting in over here. And then we get kind of confused and go, hmm, I wonder what's happening. Why are there two melting layers? Well, in this example, there was a cold front moving through. So the melting layer had a really weird shape. So if we zap our radar beam out now, um, we can see that the radar beam first intersected that little, that arm of the melting layer coming down and then intersected what we would normally see as that flat layer of melting layer. So the, the cold front was moving through, causing our melting layer to have a weird shape. And then this is what happened on radar. So just to wrap this up here with melting layers, we can see on here that we do have that nice ring of a melting layer, but then we also have other in, uh, decreases in correlation elsewhere. So uh, we have our melting layer, but then we can also see here, this bullseye is actually hail. So the melting layer is showing us a diversity of shapes and composition, but this hail is showing us that we have a diversity of shapes and orientations, and likely also in composition if we have water and ice mixed together. So this is how we lower our CC. We have pretty much all processes at play here. Um, and then we can also see multiple different things happening at the same time. Now, if we move to non-meteorological scatterers, so bugs and debris and other stuff that the radar sees, radar sees everything, by the way. Um, fun fact, radar can actually see cars driving down the highway. Um, so if you're able to pull up velocity and the radar is able to catch cars on the highway, you can see how fast people are going. Uh, just a little fun fact there. But now we're going to look at non-meteorological scatters. So uh, on the left here, we have reflectivity. And as John said before, all of this is bugs. Um, now, how do we actually prove that it's bugs? We can also see that there's enhancements of reflectivity uh, in the number one and then in the number two. So Meteorologically speaking, our storms are going to have high correlation. Um, usually these weak storms uh, just are producing rain and all rain means no diversity, which means high correlation. And if we look on our color scale here, of correlation coefficient, high correlation is towards these reds, the nice red colors, all right? So these little blops here on radar next to one and two are thunderstorms just producing some rain. Now, if we focus on this circle that's around the radar, and we see here in the correlation coefficient, it's blue, these are non-meteorological. Our correlation coefficient now is blue, which is really, really low. And this means that we're having lots of diversity of shapes. And in this case, we're looking at bugs. So this is a lot of bugs happening around the radar. Um, if you really like to look at radar a lot, and you look at it in different seasons, you'll see that this ring around the radar is very prominent in the summertime when we have a lot of bugs, but you don't really see this ring too much when uh, it's winter. There's still a little bit of return for in winter from buildings and other things, but the bug presence is not there, so this ring is not as big. So even on a clear air day when there's no, no storms happening, radar can still give you so much information about your environment. Now, this schematic is showing us uh, something a little bit different. This is actually smoke from a pyrocumulonimbus cloud. Pyrocumulonimbus, that is a fun word. Uh, pyrocumulonimbus clouds form from forest fires. So uh, we talked earlier about thunderstorm ingredients, how you need heat, um, like a large temperature gradient. You need heat, you need lift. Thunder, uh, forest fires actually provide so much heat into the atmosphere that they're able to create thunderstorms. Um, so this in particular now is lofting smoke from the uh, forest fire away. And we can see it here on reflectivity. We can also see it here in correlation coefficient. We see a, lo a local uh, lowering in correlation coefficient due to the smoke. So that's pretty amazing that we can see so many things from radar, uh, even if it's non-meteorological. Okay, so the last thing, obviously the most, uh, one of the most important things is being able to see tornado debris signatures from radar. If we can see rotation, first we look for that. Um, velocity couplet, John talked about how different velocities next to each other might indicate how the wind is moving. In this particular case, this is a very strong rotation. 
um, or velocity couplet as we're seeing here. We're seeing reds next to greens. And depending on where the ro radar is oriented, um, we can know that this is a rotation. And then we look for a low correlation coefficient co-located with the circulation. So we see now we bring up our correlation coefficient graph. There is a local minimum here. It's, it's by those blue colors, which is really, really low, which means we have a lot of diversity of shapes, particles, uh, compositions, all of that. Then we bring up our reflectivity image and we can see here there is a hook-like appendage to our supercell. And if you love the weather and you study it a lot, you know that this hook-like appendage usually means that there's rotation and sometimes a tornado associated with that. Um, so all of these clues now are telling us probably this is a tornado and this is our debris ball. And we can also now see in the dif differential reflectivity, a lowering of ZDR near zero. Now, remember we said that ZDR near zero means that we have spherical particles. In this case, that is not necessarily true. It just means that we have so many particles oriented every which way that our ZDR is nearing zero. So we can have a lot of horizontally oriented particles, a lot of vertically oriented particles, and that is what's bringing our ZDR close to zero. So if you pull up radar and you're looking at it, um, you know about some storm in Oklahoma, that maybe is producing a tornado, you might be able to actually find your own tornado debris signatures and look at it in real time. Thankfully, these kind of events don't happen too much in PA, though tornadoes do happen in PA. So always keep your eye on the weather. Um, we hope that there are no tornado debris balls that form in PA, that would be absolutely devastating, but this is how we would be able to find it on radar if you were looking for it or if we were trying to issue a warning. All right, so now we're gonna move on to hail spikes. Um, I really love hail, hail is one of my favorite things to study. So hail spikes or three body scattering signatures or TBSSs, it's a mouthful, can result from large amounts of hail or hail of large size. So it can be either or. And the process for this is that the radar beam hits the hail core, gets deflected towards the ground, goes back up to hit the hail core, and then finally returns to the radar. And I know that's very confusing. We're gonna go through schematic in a little bit, um, but let me just play this radar animation loop for you. This is our supercell and you can see these ginormous spikes coming off of this supercell. And when we were looking at this, we were like, wow, look at that hail producing storm. Cause this is quite amazing. This is very wide spikes. These are very long spikes. Um, it's quite impressive. So. We're gonna look at how exactly this happens in the next few slides. So I have here on the left, our radar, our radar beam. And then on the right, we have our cumulonimbus with one singular giant hailstone in it. And I'm gonna send this radar beam out to the hailstone. It's gonna hit it. And now what happens is that hailstone absorbs that information or sorry, that radiation re-emits it. And some of that radiation goes down to the ground. Now, when it goes down to the ground, the ground is going to absorb it, re-emit it, send it back up to the hailstone, and then the hailstone sends it back to the radar. So it's a three-step process, which why it's called a three-body scattering signature. And this radar beam that hits the stone, hits the ground, hits the stone, and then goes back to the radar is taking a really long path and hence a really long time to get back to the radar. So the radar thinks that this radar reflectivity is behind the storm, because it's taking such a long time to get back to the radar. So the reflectivity that you see, that's a spike on the radar, is actually reflectivity of the ground. So whenever you are looking at a supercell and it's producing those beautiful spikes that we just saw, you're actually looking at reflectivity from the ground. Okay, so now I'm gonna pass it off to John. Thank you so much, Rachel. Actually, before we dive into the spotter registration stuff, um, I want everybody to stick around for that because that maybe is the most important part of getting you registered. But uh, I'm just going to take a few questions. Um, thank you so much again for submitting some of these. We're not going to be able to get to all of them. I apologize for that. Uh, but I just want to hit a couple of the high points as I've been seeing some of them uh, come in. Let's see. Um, so first off, many questions about what radar uh, application to use. I knew this would come. I knew this would happen. As a government agency, we're not allowed to uh, advocate for a particular radar app because of not wanting to generally favor one over another. So unfortunately, I can't provide that. 
Um, there are many great apps out there. I encourage you to talk to your friends. I, I, I investigate what um, is out there. But one thing I can mention to you, and I'm gonna I'm gonna send this out to everybody here uh, in just one second. Um, there's a, a new web page um, that basically the the weather service is. Um, moving from its legacy radar site to a new one, and it's preview-radar.weather.gov. And I just sent that um, to everyone right now. Uh, you should be able to see that. That is the latest and greatest site for displaying weather information. And one of the things you can do is you go to the top of that, uh, click the little calendar button, and then click advanced next to local or national radar. And you can have all the drop downs of all these different renewable products and feel free to explore that. So again, unfortunately we can't answer that question directly. I'd love to be able to share that with you but as a government agency, uh, just because of wanting to respect the private sector and profit and all those things, we're not able to directly share that information uh, with you guys. Um, so let's see. Um, do, 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 do. One thing for clarification, the question was, are faster winds darker green and darker red? That's that's true. I'm sorry I didn't identify that. The higher, the, the I guess the brighter the color, the stronger the velocity. Um, and so that's uh, certainly um, uh, an important detail. Um, let's see. Uh, many people uh, have a sense of humor when Rachel showed her cows. She's, they said, we got cows. Uh, everybody's favorite. Twister movie, that's a wonderful um, <laughs> thing there. Um, let's see, somebody asked about a hill spike. Hopefully I asked that question. Um, question, uh, how can we use tilt on radar to our advantage or is there one? Would you like to take that one? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. So if we are at the lowest tilt, that means we're trying to stay close to the ground to observe what's happening closest to the ground. So that's gonna tell us what kind of particles are gonna hit us right now. Um, and if it's hailing at the ground, if it's raining at the ground. If we get to higher tilts, now we're looking at what is up in the air and what might be coming down to hit us. So that will tell us, is there hail forming a loft that's not hitting the surface yet? Um, is there anything up there that's come, gonna come down? It can tell us uh, what the height is of the melting layer, if you're interested in that. Um, sometimes, if you have a weather app on your phone, and it's automatically giving you updates. Sometimes it'll tell you it is snowing at your location and you'll look up and you'll go, no, it's not. And, but actually what is happening is that weather app is getting information from the radar and the radar is telling us above your location, maybe like 200 feet above, it is snowing. It's not just not getting to you just yet. So that's the kind of how we use like radar tilts and kind of information you can get from that. There's a whole lot more, but I won't waste time. <laughs> yep, thanks for that answer, Rachel, that was wonderful. Um, let's see here, um, the question, great question here from Laura, what's ground clutter? Um, so ground clutter is basically all the stuff that can get collected near radar. Um, what can happen actually when, radar was, or when Rachel was mentioning how you can sometimes detect uh, the speed of cars. What can happen if there's a temperature inversion is you can get refraction of the radar beam. And so in essence, what happens is instead of moving higher uh, as it moves farther away from the radar, it can get bent down to the surface. And sometimes the radar is literally detecting things in the surface. Sometimes on the ocean, you'll see sea clutter. It's like uh, the, the um, water that's being turned up by waves, things like that. So ground clutter is basically all the non-meteorological stuff close to the radar that can be detected. Uh, sometimes trees can interfere. There's a lot of different things. One thing you'll note, actually, uh, if you look at the state college radar, most days you can actually see the windmills down along uh, the ridges you head uh, along 99 towards Altoona and the Tyrone area. You can also see some windmills up across northern Pennsylvania. So those stationary scatterers that are just there all the time. Things that are tall can be detected by the radar. So sometimes you can see uh, the windmills out there as well. Um, let's see. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. I tell you what, guys, there's so many different questions here um, that I'm going to try to go through and, and, I guess, manually type and respond. If you have additional questions, we're going to have our emails here at the end. Feel free to reach out to us. Uh, but in the interest of time, we're coming up on 830 now. I want to just buzz through the spotter registration stuff. Thank you so much for bearing with us. Rachel, great job. Uh, Rachel is super passionate about this stuff, and it's really, really fun uh, to have her on board. Here's a picture that I actually took. It was actually a screen capture from a time lapse. You had some thunderstorms move through the area, so a nice lightning photo over Mount Nindy. Thought that was a, an appropriate way to start out the spotter registration uh, semblance of information. Again, it's now 8.30. 
Uh, appreciate you guys sticking around and uh, let's see if I can get control. So what a spotter is. A spotter observes the weather, a spotter communicates, a spotter stays safe, and a spotter is a critic, plays a critical role in helping the National Weather Service and local officials. That's what you guys all are. Thank you so much for coming and attending tonight. What a spotter isn't, not a weather expert, okay? We know that many of you guys have interest in weather, but we the, the weather service are doing the best that we can. We're trained to do these sorts of things. And so saying something like, hey, there's a rotation, you guys need to issue a warning. That's not particularly helpful. We're doing the best that we can. So what we want is ground truth from you. You're not, a spotter is not a storm chaser. Most storm chasers are spotters, but just because you are a uh, storm chaser doesn't necessarily mean you are a spotter. Spotter is also not above the law. You still have to follow law. We really want to emphasize this and you're not immune to the laws of physics either. Um, so please stay safe. We don't want you guys going out and putting yourselves in harm's way just to get a great photo or a great report, things like that. We'd much rather you stay safe than get a perfect report. Uh, from what's going on out there. Now, what to report? Again, I just want to hit these things. We've gone through a lot of information tonight, but we want to know the time. When did it occur? We want to know the location. Where are you? Give us as much information as you can. If you don't know your address, if you don't know exactly where you are, give us an intersection, a landmark, just something to tell us what storm and odds are we're going to be able to figure out exactly uh, which storm you're talking about. We want to know the condition. What are you reporting? Is it hail? Is it heavy rain? Is it rotation? Is it whatever it might be? We want to know what you're reporting. We want to know the source. Who are you? Please let us know you're a spotter. We want, we want to know if it's media, if you're a ham radio operator, et cetera. Let us know who you are. So here's a wonderful example. I could call in and say, hi, this is John. I'm one of your spotters. That's the source. And I'm calling to report hail. That's the condition. I'm located in Lancaster City. That's your location. We've got at least quarter size hail falling. Okay, so that's the condition again right now. It's happening at this moment. Or you could say it happened 10 minutes ago. Maybe larger gives an indication as well. So all that information is really helpful. Odds are if you call us, we're going to ask those questions anyway. So help us out, provide that information, whether on social media, via phone call, et cetera, et cetera. Now, reporting tips. Late reports are still fine with us. We still need reports for verification. So even if a storm's gone through maybe half an hour, 45 minutes earlier, still let us know that information. We're really appreciate any pictures and videos you can send. Those really help uh, give us some uh, helpful information as far as what you actually saw. Was it as big of hail as you said it was going to be? And please remember to tell us where you are, even if it's just a highway and a city reference. Now, maybe we get a call. Yo, it's getting dark here. Looks like it might be a tornado. Not helpful. Please don't send us that information. We want to know tangible information. Uh, one other plea here as you're reporting hail. Don't say marble size hail. Marbles can be of widely varying sizes. Um, so that's just a little bit of a, a pet peeve. But again, we really appreciate your reporting tips. Now, how to report. If you guys pull up the spotter reporting guideline sheet in the handouts, I'm also going to send out an email tomorrow. We have an unlisted number here for spotters. It's unlisted. Please do not share this far and wide. We want to reserve this for our spotters. But if you dial that number directly, 800-697-0010, that's going to get us directly to a forecast to report in real time what's happening on the ground. We also have this listed number. That's also fine as well. Social media, Twitter, and Facebook, we would love to see your information there. Uh, usually we'll post something out on Facebook to com excuse me, comment uh, on Twitter as well. Just tag us at NWS State College. And then finally, the example here for sending us pictures and videos. This is the email address that we encourage you guys to use to report pictures and videos. Sometimes this can be a little bit of lag time. So if you have urgent information, please call, please social media. Uh, but uh, email is probably more for uh, more delay, ctp.stormreports at noaa.gov. And again, I will send this information out. It's all listed on that reporting, spotter reporting guideline sheet that's available to you in the handouts. Okay. And now what's next? So this is the maybe the most important part. Listen here, please. I will send an email tomorrow to everybody who's attended this. In that email, there will be a form that you need to click and fill out to let us know that you attended tonight. And I'm going to ask you, are you a spotter already? Okay, if you're a spotter already, we're going to ask you to provide your spotter ID. If you don't know it, that's okay. Just give us your name and then go on and fill out your contact information and your course of well, there's a course evaluation as well. So whether you're a spotter or not, fill that thing out. If you're not a spotter, that's fine. We want your contact information so we can either update our database or add you to our database. And then there's a course evaluation. Please give feedback. This is the first time we've done this. We think it's pretty good, but we would like some suggestions for how to improve it for future iterations of this course. And then finally, if you're not a spotter yet, you'll be assigned a spotter ID number via email, okay? And if you need a reminder of what your spotter ID is, if you don't include it on there, I will remind you. But if you also are interested in being reminded, give me a little bit of time to process this stuff. I'd be happy to uh, 
provide that to you. And again, you're going to get a spot ID number if you're not a spotter yet. Please be patient with us. So we've got over 600 people that registered for the course tonight. So this may take a little bit of time, at least a couple of weeks potentially. So be patient with me. Maybe let's say if we get to August and you haven't heard anything, say, hey, John, what's going on here? So maybe I maybe you fell through the cracks or something. That's not my intent, but I'll do the best that I can to get these things out. Now, as I close here, um, I'm putting up contact information for all four of us that presented tonight. We had a great time. I would ask, though, that you use these uh, in good confidence, right? We provide these email addresses to you. These are our, our work email addresses. We get a lot of emails. We don't necessarily want these to be used for things unrelated to whether we're happy to answer your questions. We'd be more than happy to continue to help foster your interest in weather. Uh, but please uh, trust, we're trusting you with this information. So please use it wisely. Uh, and as always, feel free to collect, connect with us on social media. Um, let me just double check here to make sure uh, that uh, there's not anything additional. Um, let's see. I, I don't see anything notable at the moment. As I said, if there were questions you didn't have answered tonight, uh, please uh, shoot us an email and we can answer those questions for you or even uh, send us a comment on, on Facebook or Twitter and we can kind of get to those and communicate with folks. Uh, but man, again, if I can emphasize anything, I just want to say, please fill out the course evaluation. Uh, we really deeply desire your feedback so that we can improve this thing in the future. Uh, we were overwhelmed with the over 600 people that registered for it, and uh, we want to continue doing this. It was a blast. We really enjoyed it. Um, so thank you for taking a little over two hours out of your night uh, this evening. Uh, Rachel or Mike, anything else that you guys uh, would like to include for the good of the order? Thank you for attending. It was a pleasure to run this course for you. Yeah, we really appreciate the attendance. Uh, the, the response was great. So thank you. Cool. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, and uh, again, look for an email from me tomorrow uh, with information about how to formally submit your registration. And uh, with that, we'll see you guys on social media and through the phones. We really appreciate your reports. And uh, thank you for taking your time on a, what's this evening? Is this a Wednesday evening? Yeah, I suppose it is. Wednesday evening. All right, take care, guys. Have a good evening. Bye. <laughs> yeah. I know.